I just want to love you more. I just want to love you more. I just want to love you more than yesterday. Good morning. I just want to love you more. I just want to love you more. I just want to love you more than yesterday. Oh, I just want to love you I just want to love you more. I just want to love you more than yesterday. Oh, I just want to honor you. I just want to honor you. I just want to honor you more than yesterday. Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome, welcome, welcome to Daring Dialogues. I am your host, Shantae Charles. Today, we are only going to be on Periscope, um, so hopefully um, my YouTubers got my message this morning, and they will begin to trot on over here, uh, so we're going to give it just a few minutes to uh, let people come in. I want to say good morning, Lady Barbara. Good morning, Pastor Ben. Good morning, Lady Judy. So good to see you. Good morning to each of you who are watching by various uh, methods of viewing, whether that is by your computer or by Twitter or um, inside of the Periscope app or through your laptop. Uh, or through the link I put up on my Facebook page and you decided to click in today to see what is this young lady talking about. Today we're going to be talking about something called predictive programming. Now I find that it's very interesting since people started realizing what predictive programming is that the internet has gone to specific links, by the way, um, to say that predictive programming uh, doesn't exist to um, to say that there's no real connection between uh, what filmmakers are doing and what is happening uh, in real life. So I think that's very interesting that within the last, I would say, it looks like five to six years, um, there have been certain several articles I see that have been put out saying that predictive programming is not a real thing. Um, you know, if it's not a real thing, then why do we see so much of it? So we're going to get into that today. And then I'm going to talk to you. Good. Uh, good morning. No coincidence. I'm going to talk to you about the movie, The First Purge. Um, if you have not gotten a chance to see it, I'm telling you now, I'm going to be going into specific details on the movie. So, um, uh, if you're like me and you don't care if someone spoils the movie because you're going to go see it anyway, that's fine. But I know some people hate, <laughs> absolutely hate to be told about a movie before they go see it. So this show is not for you. Go watch the movie and then come back in and and uh, email me uh, whether or not you saw some of the same things that I saw in this film. All right. There have been other people that have talked about the first purge. So I'm not the first person. I'm not the only person talking about it. Um, but I do want to talk to it, talk to you about it minus profanity and hopefully give you some, uh, spiritual perspective on it and, um, just take a look at it. So let's take a look at what predictive programming is. So those of you who are taking notes, you can write this down as, what is predictive programming? Predictive programming is seen as a recurring element in film, as a recurring element in film. All right. And it's and it's dealing with ideas being placed within media so that when an event occurs, 
or when an idea becomes reality, the public has already softened up its consciousness to receive that idea. All right. And so it's a way of passively getting you to accept something that you might not have otherwise accepted. All right. How many alien invasion movies have we had? I mean, they have been plugging that for at least 40 years. All right. And then all of a sudden you started hearing government officials starting to come out and say, yes, there has been some uh, extraterrestrial presence and. Um, yes, there were things that were happening in the 1930s and the 1940s that we did not tell our citizens about. So now people are starting to really say, hmm, so all of these films that you all were creating that was insinuating an extraterrestrial presence or making contact with something outside of the earth, some of that was possibly you all trying to soften us up to receive that. OK, so that's just an example of predictive programming. I want to pull up. I'm going to try to pull up the trailer for the first purge. So um, those of you who have not seen anything about it, you can watch the trailer, which uh, I should be able to do without in without a copyright issue because it's already out here. All right. So let me see. The first purge trailer. Mm -hmm. Let's see. All right. Let me see if I can get it to. Here we go. All right. <clears throat> Here we go. It might be backwards for you all. I'm not sure. Wording may be backwards, but. All right. Tonight allows people a release from all the hatred and violence that they keep up inside them. This won't bring him back. It won't make you feel any better. Thank you. It is a night that is defining our country. Citizens, this will be a tradition we celebrate every year. Join. Merge. Isaiah, come say bye. So do you think, sis? Always. I'll see you tonight. People are now calling this controversial experiment of legalized crime the purge. Go my purge! You and Isaiah just stay with me doing a purge. Oh, we're going to be fine now. We are here with Dr. May Updale. She came up with this experiment. Is the purge a political device? It is a psychological one. If we want to save our country, we must release all our anger in one night. Tonight? We'll see the good and evil in everyone. This is your emergency broadcast system announcing the commencement of the first purge. Our neighborhood is under siege from a government who doesn't give a shit about any of us. At the siren, all crime, including murder, will be legal for 12 hours. There's a lot of good people out there who we're going to have to protect. All emergency services will be suspended. got to be prepared for anything. Your government thanks you for your participation. Parties, and you predicted a much higher level of participation. Human nature does not obey the laws of politics. What the hell is going on? The old ex military. It's not fucking going down, do you? Sending soldiers into the island disguised as citizens. This country needs for this to work. No one is coming to help us. After tonight, nothing will ever be the same again. They forgot about one thing. They forgot about us. So, <clears throat> the first purge. Now, 
I haven't seen any of the other ones because I have not, I don't really do horror violence movies. My husband is on here. He'll tell you that. I generally say, I don't need to see it. I don't want to see it. So I didn't go see any of the other films, but the Lord told me to go see this one. So guess what? I had to suck it up and go see it. And, um, as you can see from the preview, it's gonna, I'm going to talk about some of the things that happened um, in the film that I feel is important for us to pay attention to. The first purge is supposed to be a prequel to why, the, why they have the purge series in the first place. All right. So we know the purge series came out. I think it's up to like three of them now. And in the series, it's every year this so-called cleansing happens where people are able to murder um, in the prequel. It's 12 hours straight in the other ones. I'm not sure how long it is. I'm not sure if it's, it was increased from 12 hours to 24. All right. So this takes place on Staten Island. And as you see, you saw some familiar faces in there like Van Jones, a real uh, newscaster, broadcaster that is Every, everyone knows who he is if you watch any form of television. Um, it takes place in a place called Park Hill Towers. This is supposed to be, um, most of the film takes place in what they call the low income area. All right. The housing projects. One of the main questions that this film asks all of the people who decide to participate is they ask them, are you angry? Are you angry? And we know as believers, the anger of man cannot work righteousness. Okay, we already know this. So for this quote unquote experiment, they give, they're supposed to be giving angry people an opportunity to purge their anger by doing, by committing murder, by committing all kinds of crime, like the like the preview said, murder, including all sorts of other crimes, would be legal for those um, twelve hours. Okay. In the movie, it said that the Pope condemned the purge. Um, one of the other things that they did was supposedly about two days before this experiment, they brought everyone in supposedly for a psychological evaluation. And the psychological evaluation had to do with one question. Are you angry? And are you basically, are you angry enough to kill? And if you are, then, hey, you are perfect for this experiment of destruction. And so one of the things that they did was they offered people in this movie, they offered them $5,000 to stay home during the purge. $5,000 to people who live in low income housing, to poor people. And the, vi and the movie was mainly focused around black people and some Latino, but mainly black people. So they offered them money to stay home. And those who stayed home, they would actually um, insert a tracking device within them, all right, just in case they didn't stay home and they decided to go out and participate actively, is what they said. And then they gave them glasses where they could put these glasses on and the people who were observing the experiment could see everything they were doing or see everything that was going on through their eyes. Mm, sounds like Google glasses. Anyway, so they also said that the more you participate, in other words, yes, you can stay home and get the $5,000, but the more that you participated, the greater the monetary reward would be for your participation. And so um, that is how the film starts out. It talks about how there were 12 sites that were chosen to participate on Staten Island, New York, and that 
they called it a societal catharsis, a societal catharsis. In other words, people getting their anger out. They were looking at a specific demographic to run this experiment on. And these are some of the demographics that they were paying attention to. They asked the question, will the drug and street gang stay home? Will the drug and street gangs stay home? And then it talked about how um, within 48 hours you had, while they were doing the evals, they had within 48 hours for people to leave the island. So they people were allowed to leave the island. They were leaving on bus. Um, but the majority of the people who stayed were the poor people, the people who couldn't afford to leave the island, the people who had nowhere to go. So they decided, hey, we have nowhere to go. Some of us are going to stay home and ride this out. And we're going to be okay because it's only 12 hours, right? So there was one uh, young lady. I don't remember. I don't think I got her name. I might have it down here, but I don't think I got her name. Um, she was one of the main characters and her, her younger brother's name was Isaiah. And the drug kingpin that ran the housing projects, um, his name was D or Dimitri. So these were pretty much three of the main characters. And then there was a, a drug fiend slash mentally ill guy named, they called him Skeletor. Skeletor was very, very excited about going out and releasing his anger. And then there were also two um, older women. Good morning. There were two older women who were kind of like homeless bag ladies who kind of pushed their baskets. And um, I believe they were in the same sex relationship. They kind of alluded to that in the film. And they were talking about how they get treated badly and people talk about them. So this was going to be um, their opportunity to get back at people in the neighborhood. So again, the majority of this film took place in the low income housing in the projects. All right. So they were wondering, will the drug and street gangs participate? Will they stay inside or will they be out shooting and stealing and killing people? All right. That was the assumption that if we set up the scenario for legal crime for 12 hours that basically the drug and the street gangs would kind of do the dirty work for them. All right. But the young girl was out and she was like an activist in her neighborhood and she was standing on the car and she was, you know, trying to fire the people up and say, do not purge, don't participate. So she would have been, um, I would say kind of like the prophet in this film. She was trying to encourage her, her uh, neighbors to stay home, to don't participate, to not purge. She was standing on top of a car with a bullhorn. All right. Now, in the laboratory or in the command station where these things, uh, where the elite were standing as they were getting ready to uh, have this experiment go down, they were talking about how the one of the main characters who was working with the white female psychologist that you saw in the preview, they were talking about how he had pushed this idea through Congress and um, this whole idea of paying people to risk their lives and paying people to commit crime in order to help depopulate the country. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he had pushed this through Congress and he was like, I need this. He got the experiment approved. Now he said, I need this experiment to work. So when they questioned him and asked them, was this a political thing? The psychologist said, who came up with the experiment said, no, it's not political. It's, um, it's social, right? But the person she was working with, it was very much political to him because it was tied to the government and it was tied to the president who was um, leading at the time in this film, all right? So one of the complaints that the activist said, she said they knew that the poor would stay behind if money was offered because they're poor, 
All right. They didn't really have a lot of resources. So to a poor person in this film, $5,000 was a lot of money. Some of the people were kind of talking about things that they could get done, things that they could pay for um, if they stayed home, if they stayed on the island and just stayed at home for the 12 hours and took the money. That's very important to note. All right. So there were 12 centers participating and also there were they call themselves the three wise men and they were what we would call or what some people would call the old heads in the neighborhood. In other words, they were older, older men. I think two were black and one was Latino who kind of just sat outside and looked at the community, looked at the neighborhood, but you could tell that they were ex military. All right. <clears throat> so the young boy, Isaiah, had been accosted by the mentally ill guy, Skeletor, I think a couple of hours before the purge began and Skeletor attacks this young boy. He slashes his face. So he gets upset and riled. His sister, who's the activist, thinks that her younger brother has decided to leave town because that's what she tell he tells her. He says, oh, I'm not staying for the purge. I'm leaving town. I got on the last bus out. So she doesn't know that her younger brother has decided to stay and try to find this guy, Skeletor, to get revenge on him for what he's done. All right. So while all of this is going on, there is a drug kingpin who says, I want Dimitri, who says, I want all of the drug dealers to post up at different areas because some people were at home. Some people decided that they were going to spend the night in what they called the safest place in the neighborhood, which was the church. So there was uh, women and children mainly that piled into the, the local neighborhood church and they were watching television in the sanctuary and they were going to wait it out there. So there were some drug dealers who decided we're going to protect our neighborhood and they stood outside of the church armed. They were being the armed guard for the church. Hmm, isn't that interesting? So, so drug dealers were posted up outside of the church with the weapons. Um, they had a neighborhood gym where people were um, inside of the gym where they were posted outside with weapons. And then uh, this drug kingpin, Dimitri, said, um, everybody else, I want you to go back home. I want you to chill. You know, we're not going to participate in this uh, purge. So there was a juxtaposition of what the government thought about the values of black people, including drug dealers, versus the values of the actual people living in the neighborhood. And this is where the problem came in. Because there was another person who was under this Dimitri guy who decided that this was going to be his time to shine. This was going to be his time to break away from the kingpin and he was going to use this night to kill the kingpin so he could take over. Let's just say that didn't go very well. So I won't tell you uh, what happened with that. All right. So what you have in this film is you have this idea that because we believe all black people are criminal all we have to do is set up the opportunity for criminality and they will participate. That was pretty much the premise of the experiment. However, they weren't, they weren't um, banking on, that's a good word for it. They weren't banking on these people who, though they had no money, who, though they were in low income housing, they were not banking on them to have their own set of values for their community. All right. So the drug dealer, he basically had this, I, this sense of, you know, we have to protect our kin. This is what he said. We have to protect our kin. We have to protect our skin and we have to protect our products and our money. We have to protect our kin. We have to protect our skin. We have to protect our products. And we have to protect our money. In other words, 
Yes, I may be doing something illegal in the sense of I'm selling illegal drugs, but that doesn't mean that I am an outright killer of just anybody. All right. So what happens? He covers the, the kingpin, covers the gym. He covers his stash house. He covers the church and he sends the rest of his personnel, so to speak, back to their home. So they had two choices. All right. The young lady who speaks to the kingpin, they grew up together. She, uh, I believe she used to date him. She found out that her younger brother, Isaiah, had started selling drugs for him. So she goes in the middle of this purge to confront him about her brother's possible involvement. And she says this, she says, you have the choice to either heal or hurt. And you have chosen to hurt the neighborhood by what you've been doing. All right. So all of this is happening uh, the day before and up to about two hours before the purge actually starts. So again, those who decide to participate, they give them contact lenses to see through and they give then they put in a tracking device to find you, to see where you are during the purge. Are you at home? Are you on the street walking around? All right. And our country during this time, which is the most important piece, is that during the time that this purge is going down, the people, the human nature is in disagreement with the purge. All right. It's in disagreement, meaning that for several hours, when this purge goes down, black and Latino people are not doing what the government expects them to do. <clears throat> They're not doing what the government expects them to do. So the guy who's been working on the political angle has already put in place some other elements to make this experiment work. All right. And this is what the psychologist says. She says, in order for this experiment to work, the basic tenets of morality have to be abandoned. In order to make this experiment work, the basic tenets of morality have to be abandoned. Religious belief or religious teaching <clears throat> has to be dropped in order for this purge to be successful. So I ask you, look around you. In what ways is our society trying to get us to abandon the basic tenets of morality? In what ways is our society trying to get people to drop their faith and their belief. Because again, in order for this kind of experiment to work, those two things have to be abandoned. Morality and faith both have to be abandoned in order for this purge to be successful. All right? So what happens is, as this is going down, the gentleman who is working the political side says, man, there's nothing really happening. These people are not killing each other, at least not to the degree that we need them to in order for us to get this going as a nationwide purge, as a yearly thing that we do to control or depopulate our nation. So he realizes that nothing is happening. Um, they start seeing on the film, they're like, wait a minute, these black people are having a block party. <laughs> they're out and they're dancing and they're partying because at the same time, there's no law enforcement around. There's no one, uh, they're expecting them to be lawless without the law there. 
But rather than them being lawless, they're actually being joyful because they're not being harassed and attacked by law enforcement. So these black people, they're having a good time, they're partying, and then Skeletor comes in the midst of this party, and I won't tell you what happened, but uh, Skeletor gives them kind of their first preview of of um the purge of what they want to see happen and so as they're getting this footage they do another thing with the footage that they get because what they don't realize because they're not in the neighborhood they don't realize that Skeletor is doing most of the harm in the community mm. he's doing most of the harm he's running around free mentally ill and he's doing most of the harm in the community, but it looks like it's multiple people doing it at this point. So they get this footage <clears throat> and another element that people didn't realize was a part of this experiment is everyone who signed up, all of them get a ding to their mobile phone and they get sent the footage of the first kills of the evening. So what are they doing? Well, they figure the more that you see the violence, the more you will be incited to go participate. All right. So again, not only do they have the contact lenses uh, and the and the well, actually, yeah, they were contact lenses. Not only do you have the contact lenses that make their eyes, your eyes look um, alien like. So people know who's participating in the purge because you all have those same, you have these same lit up eyes with these contact lenses. Not only do they see, and not only are they using a tracking device on the people participating, but now they're also sending footage of other people in your community murdering other people in the hopes that it will inspire you to go and commit crime. Hmm. Sounds like the news. Hmm. Okay, so they get this first footage. They're hoping that this footage inspires more killing because remember, they need more killings to occur in order for this experiment to be deemed successful in order to turn it into a nationwide event, which of course the other films show it as that. All right, so the first kill is sent to their phones to incite them to view it. And here's the other piece. <clears throat> they were all partying. But I interrupted your party with a kill video to interrupt you from doing what you want to do to get back to the mission of the experiment, and that is to kill each other off. All right? We're not paying you to party. We don't want you to party. We don't want you to be joyful. We don't want you to enjoy community. We want you to get back to the mission, which is our expectation for you to kill each other off. Mm hmm. Or viral YouTube clips. Very good. All right. So. The drug kingpin who had decided he was going to stay home. <clears throat> gets uh, some women get sent over to the drug kingpin and he had already said, I don't want any company. I want to be by myself, et cetera, et cetera. But these women get sent to him. And so he decides to go for it. He gets off mission, stops paying attention and is uh, gets involved with these two women that have been sent over who then become who try to kill him. Because they have been sent by uh, the drug dealer that wants to take over, who's under him. So he fends for himself, winds up uh, going back to where the, the women take him to where his the guy under him is. And he winds up uh, taking him out. So he didn't want to do that. But the other guy sent someone, sent two women to kill him in his apartment. So he took care of him. All right. Now the drug dealer is like on alert because, OK, I was minding my own business. 
I stayed home. I sent my my under my under drug dealers to go and guard places. But someone has actually sent people to me to have me killed. So now he's kind of more on the guard. There's still the researchers are still trying to gauge the purge success. But the main place that they think that the killing is supposed to go down, which is in the projects, is quiet. Because they're all in their homes. They're minding their own business. They're not out trying to kill anybody. So Park Hill Tower, the projects, is quiet. Okay. So at this point, <clears throat> the government-led experiment, the politician side, begins to send out their reinforcements to make sure that this experiment works. And this is where it gets very interesting. Uh, gentlemen who at first the black people are like, who are they? What are they? You know, they start seeing them riding around in the film. They try to make them look like white supremacists that go into this church and kill almost everyone in the church. Some people managed to escape, but they killed the drug dealers that were outside. Then they went into the church and slaughtered almost everyone in there. They don't show the slaughter on film. They just tell you it's really bad. And they tell you that you don't want to go in there and see what happened. All right. But in the film, everyone who goes to the church for safety, everyone who goes to the church for safety, almost everyone who goes to the church for safety is murdered in the church by people who they would have you to think are the white supremacists. All right. So that becomes one of the, one of the um, setups that the government puts out. Okay. Then <clears throat> the um, person for government, he goes back to the female psychologist again. And he says, you know, we need to make this experiment work. What is happening? And she said, human nature is happening. It is a behavioral variable that you cannot analyze. You cannot analyze the behavioral variable because it's human nature. You don't know what people are going to do. So this is a variable that you cannot calculate. In other words, the hood was not acting the way that they wanted or the way that they predicted. Because to them, the hood supposedly had no morals anyway. So if you have no morals anyway, the next step for that should be committing crime and taking out other people. That was based, that was kind of the experimental basis. All right. And so they started seeing these people on film who had masks, who had disguises, who were hiding their identity. So then the news started asking the question, are they adding ceremony or are they trying to hide their identity because they're ashamed of what they're doing? All right. So what happens? The government starts sending in operatives, operatives to the neighborhood to move along this purge. And this is where the drug dealers start realizing, wait a minute, where are these gangs coming from? Where are these people coming from? They don't live in our neighborhood. So if they're doing, if they're starting to do harm to us, if they're starting to burn things, if they're starting to loot and steal and kill, then they're actually making it look like it's people in our neighborhood doing it, but it's not people in our neighborhood. So who are these people? Well, they were actually what's called mercenaries or hired guns. They were sent in to make sure that the purge 
goes off without a hitch. So what happens? They start, the, the hood or the drug dealers start fighting back. And they're like, wait a minute. You all are not going to come in here and you're not going to be destroying our neighborhood and trying to put it off on us. But mainly, we got to protect our kin. We have to protect our skin at this point. So they realize um, that some of the mercenaries that are sent in were Russian mercenaries that had on these masks so you couldn't tell who they were at first and they managed to get one of the walkie talkies that the mercenaries had and they realized that the whole neighborhood was being set up so they were basically trying to get rid of the lower classes and when the female, white female psychologist realized that they were taking her experiment to ultimately just simply do population control under the guise of an experiment, she began to protest that this is not what this experiment was about. This is not what this is for. Why are you trying to alter the results? So she became a pawn in this whole experiment herself. All right. So what happens? The time is almost running out for this experiment to be over. So they send in the mercenaries, they send in the big guns and they overhear them. The drug dealers overhear them on the walkie talkie saying, let's go to the hood. And basically kill as many innocent people as we can. So they began to realize that this is a whole lot more bigger and serious than what they had thought. All right. So what does that mean? That means that all of the people who were going to be paid $5,000 to stay home were actually going to be uh, exterminated. So it didn't matter that they weren't quote unquote participating actively. It didn't matter that they decided to stay home and not get into trouble. The fact was they were targeted for extermination regardless. I want some of you all to think about that. They were targeted for extermination regardless of whether they were good, whether they were bad, whether they were participating in the experiment or whether they had chosen to just stay inside until the purge was over. So they sent these mercenaries in and it was tragic. Every single floor they went in, they were kicking down doors and just shooting everybody in uh, each apartment. So they were going floor by floor by floor by floor. And this was the home of most of the people who were there. All right. And so the government official began to try to reason with the female uh, researcher, the white female researcher, and talked about how, you know, they were worried about the future and, um, you know, they had to, to get this thing going. He was still on this whole population control piece. And so because she wouldn't go along with it, they took her. And they took her into the neighborhood, threw her out of the vehicle, and then the mercenaries assassinated her. And they said, boss, it's done. And you know what he said? He said, now make that footage disappear. Now make that footage disappear. Oh no, we're not putting this on the news. Why would we put on the news a white female being assassinated by our plans? Like what happened with Heather Heyer or Heather Heyer? Oh, that should have never made the news. A white woman being run over and killed by white supremacists? Oh, that should have never made the news because you're supposed to protect white females. You're not supposed to 
exterminate them. But it let me know something about the nature of what's coming. And the nature of what's coming is understand white women who choose to participate that you can become collateral damage in the plan that is being established as well. All right. So she thought she was doing a good thing, standing be, standing by her government, putting this research together. And in the end, she was she became collateral damage. She became something to take out with the trash too. All right. So one thing Dimitri said, because all of the people who were with Dimitri, all of the drug dealers, when they heard that they were going over there to exterminate people in the projects, all of the drug dealers tried to get as many arms and weapons as they could. And they wound up taking out the people, some of the people outside. But then our government sent in drones over the people and they realized, hmm, these people are standing outside and they have no tracking device in them. So they must be uh, people who are trying to resist this experiment. And the drones began to shoot down all of the drug dealers who were going to try to go rescue the people in the hood. So after that, the only person left standing was the drug kingpin, Dimitri. So he decided, well, I'm all in. So he went in and he began to take out some of the forces. Um, and uh, one of the things that he said, he said, um, they forgot about us. I know they came to take every everyone out, basically, but they forgot about us. What was he talking about? They forgot about the people in the hood who actually will fight for the people in the hood. That's who they forgot about. They forgot about people like Dimitri that may have, that may be drug dealers, but they also have military training. Maybe they were in the military at one point. So they have that military training. They forgot about the people in the hood that have weapons themselves. That was what he was referring to. Um, even as they were going through and the mercenaries were going through each floor and they started realizing that they were receiving fire back, even the mercenaries uh, got their walkie talkie and said, we have a problem. What was the problem? The problem was there were still men in the hood. <laughs> there were still armed people in the hood who were going to fight back. And they weren't just going to go down without a fight. They weren't just going to let you come in the hood and exterminate everybody. All right. So they labeled it as citizens mounting resistance to extermination. All right. They were harming citizens inside of the housing project and continuing to kill people who stayed regardless of whether or not they were participating in this experiment. All right. So by the end of the film, the, cause they had this huge like alarm sound that go, that went off saying that the end, that the, that the time to kill legally was over. Um, the girl, her younger brother, and um, the people who didn't wind up getting killed in the towers and the kingpin came out at the end. And the girl said, Ooh, we survived. <laughs> we survived. And the kingpin said this. Yeah, we survived for now. For now. All right. And so. That becomes the prequel to all the films of The Purge. So they go back and the government lies and says 
The purge was successful. We're now going to make this a nationwide plan. All right. So was the purge actually successful? No, it was not. It was not successful. But the government said it was. And so guess what? You got a you got a whole slew of films that show you what happened after they um rig the first purge because the ultimate goal was to put something out there propaganda wise to the to the nation as an initial experiment to say hey if, if we legalize this then um you know it will work people will just use this one time to um depopulate so in the in the future purges i don't know whether or not they do the same thing where they have the mercenaries come in and start killing off more people than are actually being killed but in the first purge it clearly shows you that the experiment was not successful because the government had to bring in mercenaries to kill people all right so it was not successful what can we learn from all of this? What can we learn from all of this? A couple of things. Uh, number one, there has always been a continual plan to exterminate black, brown, and poor people. It's always been a plan. And unfortunately, in many circumstances, the plan is working. Because we have people that just don't want to wake up to what is happening. All right. Some people are awake. There will be called the resistance and other people are just not awake. Number two, the church building cannot save you. This is something we have discussed on, on my broadcast. I know many, 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 many times um, that at some point there will be a call for people to, come into quote unquote safe spaces like churches, like church buildings, and it will ultimately not be a safe space. All right. Go look up 20,000 FEMA pastors being trained to tell you to obey the government and go to the nearest FEMA center, which will probably be a church. And what will that mean? Go ask the people who were, um, during Hurricane Katrina, go ask the people who survived it what happened when everybody was herded into that stadium as a safe place. Go ask them. All right. So we have to pay attention to um, the places that people are deeming as safe and understand that the only place that's safe is in the will of the Lord and in the presence of the Lord. Go read Psalm 91 if you don't understand that. All right. Number three, what can we learn from this? Number three, the people around you have more values and uh, more morality than you actually think. All right. The reality was none of the people were buying into or were falling into the expectations that the government has set for them. They were not they were not buying into the expectation that the government had set for them. And unfortunately, we have a lot of Americans who because they they spend their eyeballs are glued to media and glued to television. Many of them, all they know about black people is what they have seen on television. So I've seen comment after comment say things like, well, black people are all criminal. Well, the majority of black people are, are, are committing crime. They, they commit crime more than anybody else. Really? Really? Please go and look at some other actual data besides Fox News. All right? So just because a person is in an environment um, that may be poor doesn't mean that the, their morals match the environment. All right? And so those were some takeaways uh, for me about this film. Um, if you don't think 
that there is not a plan underway to figure out how to just get people to exterminate themselves under the guise of science experiments. Just keep living. That's all I can tell you about that. Lastly, as I as I finish here, I wanted to uh, see if I had an image for you. Mission Impossible. Uh, that film. That film, I have one thing. <laughs> I have one thing to say about that film. Let me see if I can find it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. In the film Mission Impossible, they the premise in the film is that these people called the apostles are going around threatening the world. Hmm. Why are they called the apostles? And I believe there were 12 of them. Mm -hmm. The apostles were the threat to the world. The 12 apostles were threat to the world. And they had plans to blow up. They were, they were seen as religious radicals and they had plans to blow up the holy sites. And uh, in the film, it showed Rome being blown up. It showed Jerusalem being blown up and it showed Mecca being blown up. So ask yourself, out of all the things that they could have called these actual terrorists in this film, why would they choose to call them the apostles? What connection were they trying to make with actual apostles. So now, people who are not uh, versed and not religious, who have never heard the term apostle, they've never, maybe they haven't opened a Bible, they haven't heard the term apostle, if they have gone and seen this film, they will now link apostles to terrorism. Just like that. So, those of you, here it is. I wanted to make sure I, I actually took a picture of it because I couldn't believe, <laughs> I couldn't believe that, um, and you all probably can't see that very well. All right. But across their, across their faces, they were supposedly be, they were supposedly unknown, but it said across their faces, the apostles. Of all the words they could have used to describe terrorists, how did they get away with naming them the apostles? And why? Why, when you have an awakening happening in the body of Christ, in the kingdom of God, why, when you have an awakening as to an understanding of what true apostleship is, why would you put in a film and why would you connect apostles, the word apostles, with terrorism? Why would you do that? Is it just coincidence? Or is it to get you to think about true apostles as religious terrorists? Well, my time is up. This has been another episode of Daring Dialogues. And I've been your host, Shante Charles. I hope that if you have not seen The First Purge, that you actually go and see it. I gave an overview. I told you about some elements in the film, but you need to go see it. If you are black and brown, you need to go see it. If you're a white female working in research, you need to go see it. If you are a brother from the hood, you need to go see it. If you consider yourself a drug kingpin, you definitely need to go see it, all right? I said to myself, Dimitri is my new hero. I don't know about T'Challa, and I don't know about Killmonger, but I know some Dimitris, all right? I know some brothers who will protect the hood with their very life at all costs, all right? So, Dimitris out there, you need to go see the first purge because they're talking about you. They're talking about the fact that you are the element of surprise. You are the person that stands between government extermination 
and the hood. All right. So remember, light is the most daring opposition to darkness. So please go out today and be light. Share this broadcast with someone who doesn't mind spoiler alerts. Share this broadcast with someone who's already seen the first purge. I want to hear from you. Once you go watch it, email me. Tell me what you thought. Tell me what you saw in the movie that maybe I didn't see. Because guess what? We all don't see the same thing. All right? Remember, light is the most daring opposition to darkness. So please go out today and be light. Take care and God bless.